Martin, thank you very much for what was a really fascinating address. We're going to have 20 minutes now for questions, so I hope you um, will all have them. I felt that there was a challenge for everyone in this address. Uh, and I think the thing that I like the most is that you are an optimist. You very much see the glass half full, and I share that sentiment. I like the way you said that we may have just scratched the surface of productivity improvements coming from current technology, and I think that's very right. And I think it was important that you reminded us that innovation is not invention, it's the application of new ideas, and those ideas can be business models or public policy as much as their products and services. Um, we've been reminded that for innovation to drive productivity to improve our living standards, business has to adopt the idea and regulators have to let them and governments have to recognise that this cycle might result in creative destruction. But of course, the bit that got me going was the bit about our middling management practices. So that's a challenge that I'm going to take away to think about a bit and see what I might be able to do about in the settings where I have some control. So now I have given you plenty of time to think of your questions. Who is a question for Dr Parkinson? We've got some microphones as normal. We've gone over here on table 13. If we could just do the normal courtesy of who we are and where we're from, and I know that won't be a problem with you, Megan. Thanks, Megan Motto from Consult Australia. Martin, today we were talking a lot about uh, innovation, of course, and risk and leadership and bravery and all of those things that become the inexplicable package that really can boost our productivity. And one of the things that struck me is uh, oftentimes we send our best and brightest at the really leadership, top echelons of leadership off to Harvard or Yale or some other overseas academic institution. Do we have the right structures here to be able to produce the leaders that we need of the future? Oh, yeah. Look, um, I, I, I think we absolutely do. Um, and, in fact, uh, I, I think the fact that um, so many of, uh, of our folk end up going and um, uh, getting educated overseas and uh, uh, being successful overseas is a really good thing because um, if you think about this as a cycle, inevitably what happens is those people bring others with them and many of those gain experience and gain expertise and then bring that back home. So if you look at the um, Australians who have made it on Wall Street, for example, um, this, is, this is a much bigger market, much bigger platform than anything we could offer here. Uh, and yet they go there, people, you know, um, people go there, they're incredibly successful, and often then they bring the, that sort of expertise home. Uh, and I think you can see that in all sorts of fields. Um, so many people now, for example, in, um, uh, in places like biotech uh, coming back. Things like, um, the, the sorts of things I, I think are really important though for us is to help foster that uh, innovative ecosystem is to ensure that there are support mechanisms and there are, there's the right sort of environment when they get back. So, the Advanced Manufacturing Centre that Andrew Stevens is leading, the, the research centres, cooperative research centres and things like that are really important for creating opportunities as are our universities and importantly as are our firms for bringing the best and brightest back to Australia and getting them to start to innovate back here. And I think one of the areas we've done really well in that is, um, is in the biotech space. But, uh, Others would probably know more about that in detail than I do. So, quick straw poll. <coughs> Who have we got in the room who's either a migrant, so someone born somewhere else that's come here to bring their expertise, or someone that's had a few years at least, or maybe more offshore and is a returnee? How many of those have we got? Two up here? Yep. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that interesting? Just in a room of this size. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that makes the point. Um, Charlie Taylor, perhaps? Thanks. Uh, Charlie Taylor with McKinsey. Um, it was interesting to hear some of the thoughts around opportunities for private sector management practices, and particularly in the manufacturing sector you were talking about. It would be interesting to hear your thoughts on um, around innovation and productivity in the public sector, which you mentioned, yep. a little bit more about that. 
particularly given the context, the challenges there around politics and winners and losers, and how do you think, how, how will the public sector um, lead innovation and learn from elsewhere around the world as well? Yeah, look, I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, in, in many ways, um, the, there's this view that the public sector itself, so basically public servants, are inherently risk averse. Um, I don't know that we're actually really that much different to anyone else, but I do think it's true that when we come to look at problems, uh, we face competing pressures. So um, <clears throat> if, if I... Um, let's take an anti-dumping case, right? So uh, you're running a business, you feel that you're being um, unfairly competed with, somebody's um, engaging, in anti -dump uh, engaging in dumping. So you come to government and tell me that this is terrible, you're going out of business. Well, think about what I've got to think about. Um, well, actually, really? Are you as efficient as you could be? Is this company that the, the international competitor really dumping? Um, is it just the state of the global market? Um, if I actually conclude that they are dumping, um, what do I do? Who wears the cost? Ultimately, it's the consumer. So you've got lots of competing issues that come to come to the fore. <clears throat> and let's put aside anything around the politics, and you raise that, and I'll, I'm going to let that one slide through. Um, but uh, I, it's not clear to me that the public sector is inherently less... Um, innovative. I think the incentive structure doesn't always help us be innovative. But just to give you an example, today, uh, well, Prime Minister and Cabinet tasked our new graduates for this year, put them into five groups and said, go forth and come back with some really innovative ideas uh, about how we might um, do things differently. So today we've had presentations from one group on the idea of crowdsourcing policy development. Um, and, uh, you know, really interesting ideas. Um, another one around the, um, the whole concept of, um, uh, of cooperative policy development, explicit cooperative policy development um, with the private sector. Again, really interesting ideas. Question is, why haven't we done it to date? Maybe, we're, maybe we are less innovative, maybe the incentive structure is not quite right, but um, one thing I've been doing since, uh, since I took over this job is telling the public sector that we've got to become more innovative, we've got to release data, you know, we can't hold data to ourselves, we've got to be prepared to fess up when we get it wrong. Um, there have been a couple of instances where people have had to fess up big time in the last little while. Uh, but, you know, we, the natural tendency, so take, so let's be explicit about it, the, um, the MBS, PBS data, um, natural tendency if we were risk averse would be to say, well, we better not release any data again. In fact, what I've been struck by and regard as incredibly positive is the, well, what lesson do we take from that so we can actually accelerate the release of data from the public sector? Um, and I think that's really important. So I'm not sure we're necessarily less innovative. I think we haven't got a track record of being innovative, and so um, we've got to go and now prove that we're up to it, uh, and we'll know in the next couple of years. So, so take that as a challenge. Yeah. Invite, invite me to reflect on it in a couple of years' time. And it was interesting to hear you allude to incentive structures, because we heard a lot today about the lack of the right incentives to foster innovation and mm. particularly longer term thinking um, within the private sector. So I think some themes. I think we have a question over here. Oh, hi, Martin. It's uh, Martin Halloran from Commonwealth Bank. Hi. Hi. Um, firstly, very glad to see you again uh, leading uh, public policy uh, uh, reform and shaping public policy in Australia. Um, and I just wanted to just reflect on advice to government and you. Uh, you use a lot of quotes today from uh, well-known economists, and I just want to use a quote from a well-known futurist, uh, Nicholas Negroponte, who's also the uh, co-founder of the Media Lab at uh, MIT. Martin, can you just lift the mic? A bit higher. Thanks. Thanks. 
Um, Nicholas Negroponte said that um, incrementalism is the enemy of creativity. Hmm. And he also said that the best measurement of impact is self-evident in that if you have to measure something, then probably the impact is small. I just wondered how, if anyway, um, you leading public policy advice to the government, um, are you sort of pushing those themes as well in that, you know, change is, is change better in incrementally? Is innovation better incrementally? Or are you going more for that uh, incremental, uh, incrementalism stifling creativity? Good question. Um, I think... I think a lot of the things that, as public servants, we may have focused on in the past as being innovative are incremental, whereas it seems to me that the bigger changes you get are iterative, um, and that goes back to the uh, incentives issue, um, which is, you know, it's got to be OK to fail, um, and if the incentive structure, whether in the private sector or in the public sector, doesn't allow you to fail and fail fast, and then if you've learned something, try and try again, um, then I think you actually might find it really hard to, to foster that culture of innovation that, um, that we all want to see. And I think, you know, I, I often reflect on um, the cultural difference between uh, Australia and the United States. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to paint this in extreme, in extremis, but it always strikes me that in the US, if I have a go and I fail, um, but I've seen to learn something and I've got another good idea, people will be willing to have a, be willing to back me again. And I might even fail a second time, and yet if I've still got another good idea and people can see that I'm, I'm getting closer to it, then they're still inclined to back me. Yeah, the turtle will get, the, 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 high, the bar will get higher. Whereas in Australia, there's often a tendency to say you failed. And it's sort of like you've got a mark on your forehead and that's it. Um, and you see it in a sort of different approach, uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy versus uh, our approach to bankruptcy. Now, it's true um, Chapter 11 uh, doesn't necessarily help some of the suppliers, um, but uh, I think the fact that our two bankruptcy systems are so different says something about the culture of our two economies and if we want the two societies and if we want to be more innovative we've got to think about um, are we putting artificial barriers there and that's one of the things why one of the reasons why I thought the um, national innovation science agenda uh, that the Prime Minister launched at the end of last year was so important because it's the first time we've actually tackled head-on um, are our bankruptcy laws acting as an inhibitor to innovation uh, so I think there's a whole variety of issues at play here um, that, that will go to culture. Uh, and um, you know, maybe it's culture that is the important thing about whether you're incrementalist or iterative. Okay, I think we've got a question over on this side of the room, a bit of a tennis match. Howdy. <clears throat> Howdy. My name's David. I run Uber here in Australia after a five-year stint in the US. You're in a room full of people who clearly believe in, in economic growth and innovation as an enabler, but uh, the benefits aren't always equally distributed. Do you have any thoughts on, on how to navigate when there's something that's clearly good for the economy as a whole, but not every person sees it as a benefit for them personally, and how to, how to keep the agenda moving? Oh, look, I, th I think um, the... <coughs> the challenge with any um, change or reform is that there's always a concentrated group, well, not always, but, but there's often a concentrated group who are losers, and um, there's the... <coughs> oh, excuse me. The winners get small benefits and they're widely dispersed. Um, and that's, uh, that's ever been thus... Uh, and is always the challenge in trying to sell um, reform or sell new, pro new product or process ideas. Um, how do you go about... <coughs> sorry. How do you go about creating uh, that sort of um, an environment which wants people to step forward and support you? Uh, we know the political economy of that is that 
The losers are small in number and the losses are large, so they're prepared to spend a lot of money to um, try and stop things happening. So it really comes down to, <coughs> sorry, comes down to people like us, um, the advocates for reform, for change, to try and create the narrative of why this is ultimately in the interests of the Australian people. Uh, and not, you don't do it about an individual um, item. Uh, you, you try and do it about the process of reform, the process of change. I mean, that's basically, um, if you think back to our history, we, we talk about the 80s and 90s, but... Um, <coughs> sorry. Why, why were we so able to, um, to drive big reform in the 1980s? Well, we'd had a decade before that was bookended by two recessions. Um, we had an Australian populace that had already come to the view that uh, our living standards were in relative decline and we had to do something about it. And that was a really then rich environment um, in which to, to push the narrative for reform. It doesn't mean that reform was easy then. It doesn't mean it was easier than it is today. But it does mean that the context was different from a situation where we've had 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth. Um, so in this context, it's a much harder narrative to create that says to people, actually, it's really in your interest and in your children's interest and in your grandchildren's interest that you know, we actually make some changes today, even though they may discomfort you somewhat. And thanks, David. I came here tonight in an Uber. <coughs> Rod Maddox? Yeah, uh, Rod Maddox, uh, Monash University and CEDA. I guess my question is as much to Diane as it is to Martin. Are our boards uh, too insular and too risk averse? And I guess the broader question then is to Martin, similarly, is our, is our leadership broadly too conservative and too insular? Well, I didn't think I was up here for questions. And Martin, you spent some time, although I must admit, one of the briefest stints on the ORICA board, I think it was the 1st of October to the 31st, 31st of, December of December 2015. Um, but maybe you'd like to make some comments on that. And I think this plays a bit to our diversity shared agenda. Yeah. Look, uh, it was one of the things that struck me, um, uh, leaving the public sector and going to into the private sector, was... Um, uh, there was not a view, there's not a shared view about whether um, diversity in terms of international perspectives is, um, uh, is valuable or not for a firm. Now, I went onto the board of Orica, which um, had a very, you know, quite diverse um, board. Uh, it's a company that operates in 100 countries, um, has operations in 50, so has, has facilities in 50, um, and it had uh, board members from um, uh, a range of countries, uh, and as well as international uh, leadership. Uh, so, um, and I found that a really interesting model, and thought um, it was uh, it was great, and it was also a board that, uh, while we could have done better on gender diversity, we were doing pretty well. Uh, and I, I recall, and, and Paul may um, even have been at this lunch, we were, uh, there was a lunch um, in, in Sydney and there was a whole group of um, CEOs and chairs sitting around and I um, innocently asked that question. Um, I, is it better for boards to be diverse? Yes. Is it better for boards to be diverse by having people from you know, international representatives on them? Really interesting discussion that followed. Uh, I don't think any of us quite know um, whether that really pays off or not, uh, but I think the evidence that it's better, at least within country, to have more diverse voices, um, the evidence is absolutely indisputable. I mean, you can see it in the performance um, of, uh, of individual companies, those that have more diverse uh, leadership, more diverse voices around the table uh, do better. Uh, asked about the public service, uh, it, it is undoubtedly the case in that um, having more diverse views um, feeding into public policy will strengthen that. And one of the challenges for us, and this is why I said at the outset, one of the areas of public sector innovation is how do we think about, how do we go about getting, uh, engaging the community better? 
Um, so how do we get uh, leadership teams that are more reflective of the Australian society? How do we get inputs that come from a much more diverse group of people? Because I'm firmly convinced that um, that that will actually make policy development more robust uh, and um, actually more policies more effective on the ground. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, so I'll give you my answer to your question tomorrow because I do have some thoughts, and a lot of it's about how do you get people to want to come to Australia if they're not already resident here. But I think we have one question over here, and this will be our last, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. Martin, Catherine, Carolina McManus, Giant Ideas. Um, you made an interesting comment about uh, Australia and services, that we, we didn't have competitive advantage in services. I could have um, misquoted that. So I'm interested to understand where do you see as a nation we have competitive advantage um, and, com and comparative advantage, sorry, and also um, what if with those sort of areas, why are the opportunities for further innovation? Mm -hmm. um, so we actually, we have a natural comparative advantage in um, uh, resources and energy, right? Resources, it's obvious. Um, we have two of the, uh, the world's largest um, resource companies, uh, either Australian domiciled or um, joint um, representation here in the UK being BHP and, um, and Rio. Uh, and it's not a surprise that when you look at the resource sector, it's actually also, when you look at the role of the juniors, the junior miners, um, it's actually incredibly innovative and it's really risk-taking. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a sort of a, a natural ecosystem. That's sort of one of the areas where we are able to innovate because um, it is such a comparative advantage for us. Uh, ditto in agriculture, uh, but the point I was trying to, I've been trying to make is that if you think about um, if you think about what's happened over the last uh, decade and a half, um, it's almost like we went to sleep one night and we woke up the next morning, and the world was prepared to pay a lot more than it did the day before for our resources. So the first thing that happens is that we get this massive boost to national income. Uh, the second thing that happens is that we realise that we should go and dig out some more resources, and so we go on the biggest mining investment boom in our, in our history. We tripled the mining sector capital stock in a decade. So when you think about it, mi mining investment was typically about 2% of GDP, and at its peak it was reaching 8% of GDP. Now, we're going to get the benefit of that over a very long period of time. Um, now, uh, if you look around the, the countries in our region and the, the emerging economies, they're not in that same um, energy-intensive or steel-intensive part of their, their development. Yeah, India's got a way to go, Indonesia's got a way to go, Vietnam, but none of them are going to have, be as big an impact as China was. So. What's next? Well, the second part of that um, process was we and New Zealand, and New Zealand even more so than us, have benefited from the massive growth in demand as people have become wealthier for food products. Um, so again, we've got a natural advantage there. Uh, but where are people going to go now? Well, as they become wealthier, they're going to look for um, they're going to look for niche manufactured products, so high tech manufacturers. They're going to look for services, um, both experiential, like tourism. Um, they're going to look for services where we have an intellectual property advantage. And in fact, advanced manufacturing, we do very, very well. And there's a couple of examples I cite in the, the written version of the speech, where Australian firms are actually you know, world leaders because of an IP advantage. And that's where it really comes down to the innovation bit. If we're going to succeed, in the services sector and in advanced manufacturing, which is where future demand is going to be very, very strong, we've got to find the IP advantage because that's how we create competitive advantage, which is different to the comparative advantage that we have in, in agriculture and, uh, and mining. Um, but, you know, the fact is that uh, many of our services firms have already started going overseas and have done quite well. Um, what I, I suppose what I'm really saying is that 
an economy that itself is um, almost 80% services, uh, the opportunity for greater growth in services exports is really only limited by our imagination. Um, the opportunity for us in uh, advanced manufacturing is entirely IP driven. So I keep looking at Andrew who's nodding, um, but I actually think that the work that Andrew and the AMC are doing uh, is absolutely critical to be creating the sorts of opportunities for us going forward. Thank you, Martin. I'm now going to call on Dr Ian Watt to propose a vote of thanks. We might ask you to stay there if you don't mind. Thank you.